you want to learn more about effective management, head over to madsingers.com and sign up for my free management training. Welcome to the Mad Singers Management Podcast from madsingers.com, where entrepreneurs and business managers learn and share. If you like the show, don't forget to leave a review. Hello, and welcome to this next episode of the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Henry. Welcome to the show, Henry. Thank you, Mad. It's nice to be here. Excellent. Henry, somewhere around the world, someone doesn't know who you are. Would you mind doing a quick introduction so they will know for the future? Yeah, of course. I, uh, I will be happy to do that. So my name is Henry Das. Uh, I'm an American. I live in uh, New Jersey, uh, although I consider myself a New Yorker, having lived there for 30 years. I am a serial entrepreneur. I am a business coach. I'm the author of a, of a book about money and I'm a personal finance coach and I write screenplays and I play golf and I collect baseball cards. Uh, I do a lot of stupid stuff in my leisure time. Um, yeah, that's basically me in a nutshell. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, we've met a, a few times, I think, over the years. So uh, I'm, I'm really interested to, to do this interview and, and hear more from you. So uh, I, I'm sure this will be super, super relevant for the audience as well. So one of the things, Henry, that we talked a little bit about before we kicked off this show is, is Seven Silos. And, I, and you're writing a book about that right now. Do you want to talk a little bit about what these seven silos are? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good, great jumping off point. So um, I'll give you the backstory. I'll put my screenwriter cap on. So um, I have, there's like three acts. I'll, I'll make it concise though. So a few years ago, I was doing a coaching call with a, a, a fella who runs a SaaS business in uh, Australia, actually, Gold Coast. Um, and during the course, uh, I jotted some notes where I wrote down like the different aspects of a business. And I just, I just kind of wrote them down and there were seven of them. And then I started thinking, huh, I wonder if there, if this encompasses everything that a business uh, might run into. So then I started keeping a keen ear to it as I worked with, with uh, other clients and other, other client calls. Um, and so then one day I took those, those, those seven words that I had and I went on the internet and I went on to, to an, what I called an acronym creator, which I didn't realize seven is the number of, of uh, tiles in a Scrabble game. So it took me to a Scrabble site. So I punched the first letter of those seven words in and it popped out a word. And the, the only word in the English language is codfish. You know, this is weird, but that's the name of my book. It's called codfish. So what does codfish stand for? Uh, customer service or customer support, operations, development, finance, infrastructure slash IT, sales and marketing, and human resources. So those were the seven things we put down, not in that particular order. And then after going through all this jumble, that was the word that popped out. And every aspect of your business will fit into one of these silos. And I call them silos for a reason, because as your company starts to scale up, you will discover, especially as you start adding headcount, that these silos are silos. They, people don't talk to each other. So the other part of the book has to do with what I call the synaptic connections between these silos and how to get those to operate in concert and work efficiently. So good, so thank you for asking me that because nobody really asked me the origin story, although I, I did write about it in the book, so. I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for Cutfish then. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. It's a, in, it's a work in progress right now. I'm, I'm writing a little bits of, li little bits and pieces of it and then I'm um, sort of syndicating them on my blog and on Facebook and on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. And it's just kind of how I'm building it, which is a little different than how I, how I built my previous book, which I just started at the beginning and then over two months wrote it all the way to the end, 432 pages. Uh, yeah. So this is a little different. I love that. I think it's a good way to develop a book as well, because I think a lot of the time, 
you know, you have a lot of thoughts, you have a lot of knowledge in your head, but sometimes every time you have to sort of formulate yourself and so on, you might think about a slightly different or, you know, you might get different points from different people and so on. So I think that sounds like an interesting way to, to formulate it's, a book. It's, it's nonlinear. And the nice thing about it is, um, like you said, when something becomes present on the front of your brain, you can write about it. Uh, I'm actually in a writer's group because my wife is trying to write a book. She's in a writer's group with a, with a fellow by the name of Seth Godin. And she sort of roped me into this community, writer's community. And I'm not a big fan of that kind of stuff because I think writing is very much a individual um, pursuit. Uh, yeah. And there's a lot of people building these outlines and doing all this stuff and all this, what I call getting ready to get ready. Yeah. And my advice to them is just write, right? You can pay, cut and paste it into some logical order later, but when the thoughts are in your head, don't put them aside because it's not what you're working on right now. Dive into that. You'll, you'll figure it out later on. I mean, it's, but yeah. if you want to be a writer, you got to write. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, actually, one of my, my friend, Greg, Gregory, he, he keeps saying that, you know, if you want to write the essence, it's not like don't sit around and wait for creativity. It's about words, right? You need to put the words down every single day. And right. yeah, not much of a writer for me, though. I'm, uh, I, I like the, the, the spoken word a lot more. So. Podcast is, is you know, pretty much a functional equivalent. Yeah. yeah. Right. Let's talk some more business. Uh -huh. yeah, I know you have, you have a good book already out around finance. And that's obviously a topic that sure. a lot of entrepreneurs are struggling with. So my, my best question for you right now is what is the number one thing around finance that you see your clients struggle with pretty consistently? Okay. Uh, you want me to talk about it pre-COVID or, or post-COVID? Uh, yeah, pro probably. Let, let's make it pre-COVID. I think COVID let's is... Let's start with uh, pre-COVID. Okay. Yeah. So pre-COVID, um, I would say the biggest issue um, that I've run across with lots and lots and lots of clients is simply not being conversant, not really knowing their numbers. I've been, I've been challenged on the idea that you need to know your numbers backwards and forwards. You know, people have challenged me and I've done presentations on that and I've done groups and people are like, really, Henry, I have to know them backwards and forwards. I'm like, yes, you do. I can't just kind of know them and have the accountants. It's like, no, no. When you're first, especially if you're first starting out. I think it's extremely important that you really know them backwards and forward. You know what your gross margins are. You know what your cash flow is, right? You know all uh, everything about your balance sheet, everything about your income statement, right? These things are critical to running your business. If you want to outsource that to somebody else later on down the line, sure. If you're running 100, 200, 500, if you're running a billion dollar company, uh, yeah, you're not sitting there day-to-day uh, -day managing your books, and it would be foolish. You wouldn't be able to run your business. But if you're a new business, if you're an under-million-dollars entrepreneurial business, yeah, I would challenge you that you need to know that stuff. Yeah. It's too yeah, important. I I, I definitely agree. And I think I, I see a lot of people in the same. I, I'd say there's different businesses that probably need it more. So yeah, I've worked great. with a lot of SaaS businesses or uh, I mean, SaaS, it's, it's also important for acquisition, but e-commerce particularly is probably where it's most important, right? Because mm -hmm. so often they're making so many decisions and cash flow is just so critical for them. Whereas some of the business I run myself, like in the service industry, I, I still know, obviously I know the finances very well, but, uh, you know, understanding the finances or like having a hundred percent grasp on the number is a little bit less critical on a day-to-day -day basis. Whereas particularly I see so many e-commerce owners really just fumble above themselves, like making way too big orders for one product. So they can't afford to order other products and yep. you know, mm -hmm. not understanding the actual cycle. And I, like I had a guy who was super successful, right? He was uh, making well over seven figures uh, a year. Mm -hmm. And he basically called me up and said, 
mess. There's no money in the bank account. I can't pay my staff. What do I do? And you're, <laughs> you know, you're like, and, and the guy had about 25 staff at this point, right? I'm yeah. like, well, that is a great example of definitely what not to do, right? So if you just live by your bank account, just see, is there money there? Oh, great. Let's Trust me, I have met people who run their business out of the bank account. Uh, my jaw drops. Yep. It's like, uh, no, you cannot do that. But you bring up a great point. One of the things that I tell people over and over again is you must have a credit line, right? And yep. you must get that credit line when you don't need it. Because when you do yes. need it, you won't be able to get it. Yep. I don't care if it's just $25,000 or $10,000. Not a credit card. That's an idiotic interest rate. I'm talking about a real bona fide line of credit from a bank. Get that. You need that. Certainly now, if we talk about post-COVID, uh, yeah, when that happened. You wish you had it. Yeah, you wish you had it. Now, even if you did have it, uh, it was only going to last so long, right? Yep. Um, I, I can only really speak authoritatively about the tax code in the U.S., but it, you're de-incented from really keeping money in your business because of the threat of double, double taxation, right? So most businesses, even one of my clients is close to $10 million business, has over 100 employees. But when we, when I know his numbers, and when we sat down, I said, you know, you've got three weeks to live, right? If your business went to zero, his business didn't go to zero. But had his business gone to zero, he would have been negative in three weeks. Yep. That's how fast money gets burnt, right? When there's no money coming in the door. Definitely. Yeah, and, and I mean, you, you mentioned the U.S., so in, in Denmark, where I'm from, uh, we've had negative interest rates. So you've literally had companies that took money out of the bank because they, they, they had to pay money to have money in the bank. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just silly. Which is that. absurd, right? Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely very few places in the world, they encourage businesses to have money in the bank account. So interesting. And... What's sort of the basic, like if, if we look at it again from a finance perspective, so for people who are sitting there, you know, they don't know their numbers, they're like, okay, I now start to understand I need to know the stuff. What, what is sort of the basic stuff you feel people need to know? Well, I would start with a, a balance sheet. First place you start. So what's a balance sheet? Essentially a list of, you know, your, your um, assets and your liabilities. Why is it called a balance sheet? Because at the, at the end of the day, it has to balance. Your assets and, and liabilities need to match. Um, you were talking about SaaS businesses. They probably have very little hard assets on the books, right? They're doing just-in-time inventory. So even the even the the month-to-month uh, -month inventory uh, carry is probably pretty minor. Uh, but you still need to know what those numbers are. Right, especially if you do go for a line of credit, since most banks, at least in the U.S., are, are balance sheet lenders. That's what they're that's what they're looking at. So they want to see something that's healthy. Makes sense. So that's that's a good starting place. Starting place. And when I when I um, uh, wrote my FQ book, I kind of went chapter by chapter, and I have a whole chapter on figuring out your personal net worth. Well, that's the functional equivalent of a balance sheet for a company. Right, then you got to go through your profit and loss, your P&L, right? You can't manage your business out of your bank account because you've got receivables and you've got, you know, bills that have to be paid. So at any moment in time, your bank account might look wonderfully robust because you got a big check from a client, right? But what you haven't done is pay for all the cost of goods sold. So five minutes later, your bank account could look pretty awful because you just had to pay everybody and you're waiting for receivables. So that's sort of number two. And then, this, and then your cash flow is kind of a mix of both. It's like money that goes out that's for say capital expenditures and things like that, that have to be depreciated, right? You know, technically you buy a computer, you got to depreciate it over the cost uh, of a couple of years because that's very different than buying a ream of paper, which gets used and it's done. And that's just an expense. So that's sort of the really basic stuff that everybody needs to understand. I'm not saying you need to be a CPA or a book. Okay. I don't believe 
you need to have that level of knowledge. But it's similar to, to law. You don't have to have a law degree, but you do have to have at least a, 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 a passing sense of how the law works and how it might impact your business. Right? Yeah, and, then you and understand the pros the, when and limitations do. of what you can do, right? So that's, that's critical. Yeah. So, okay, I, I like that. That's a good, uh, good starting point, and, and I totally agree. I, I think as well, for, for me, one of the key things is you, you need to understand your business and also understand, you know, what's the most critical aspect. So what I always tell people, again, if, you, you know, if you're doing inventory business, you, you definitely need to learn how to sort of do projections. You need to learn how to, you know, look at it. I mean, if you are ordering products and you have a three month delivery time, you definitely need to start working on predictions and so on. If you're running a SaaS, the critical thing is often, you know, how much can I spend on marketing? What is my marketing budget to actually mm-hmm. grow this thing? And so right. depending on your business, depending on the business model, you, I always advise people to really get to know their particular area of, of sort of critical finance, right? So. Well, yeah, I even take it one step further. When I look at the silos, I mean, each of them has, you know, a silo is where you put grain, right? And it goes up and down depending on the season. And it's the same thing really applies to businesses. And some of the silos are also going to require much more attention. So if you're a SaaS business, you're really driving your business out of the operations silo, right? I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the, really the core place. If you are a, a body shop or an IT company that, um, you know, that uh, augments headcount, uh, you're spending most of your time in the HR silo, right? You're managing people. Um, and they, they bounce around, but there's usually one, there's usually one silo where a, um, uh, a business originates. Like my first business, which was a computer company, came right out of the customer service silo. I was just better at servicing customers who wanted to um, source computers for their business. Now, again, this is going back 30 years, pre-internet, everything. So I spent the lion's share of my time on servicing those customers because it was the differentiator that would get them to choose us as a small business to work with as opposed to some gigantic company. Yeah, and I I mean, I I run an outsourcing company, right, where we have 120, 30 staff or something. And, mm-hmm. and yep. in, in that case, like uh, the benefit again with a service business, we always charge people up front. So in, in the end of the day, we're never going to be out of out of pocket. But right. basically the, the key focus for us is recruitment, right? Because sure. when, when people are getting solid staff, they're happy, right? They're happy. If they get crap staff, it doesn't work out. So for us, for us, the, the number one thing is, is all about HR and recruitment and yeah. you know, finding, finding you great know talent. Well. Excellent. Very good, Henry. Very good. Sure. In terms of, you know, people starting out, people, uh, I mean, the majority of the audience listening here are small business owners, right? right. And they're generally in a situation, what I, what I see the most is, you know, they have all these places they want to invest cash in their constantly, you know, oh, I have 500 in the bank, let me go spend it. Um, what, what's the best way to figure out where should I prioritize my investments? Well, you can look at it from a couple different standpoints. You're looking for ROI, return on investment. So if I've got 500 bucks available to me in some free cash flow, where am I going to get the best return? Right? So that's a one way to look at it. You can uh, do what uh, we call in the coaching business an environmental upgrade. You know, buy yourself some better plant and equipment. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can hire some some other folks. A um, lot of things that you can do. Always with an eye towards the critical path. What's the critical path of my business that's going to make it profitable? And how do I nurture that? Right? Yes. So if you're living in the HR silo because that's the critical path for your business then that's the logical place to look where can i invest this money to to maximize that now the other side is the risk side right which is the part that everybody ignores so 
the the other way you can analyze it is to say, okay, how could I use this five hundred dollars to de-risk my business in some way? Yep. Right. Yep. Um, I like you that. You as a business like owner that. have to make these decisions every single day. That's why you're the entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah, and and definitely from from my point of view, a couple of things that I think is important. So when when as a business, when we look at investment opportunities, I, I tend to look at it in two ways. So definitely ROI is important, but what people often forget is what's the actual turnaround. Because if your ROI is like on a three year basis, that's very different than if it's on a three month basis, right? So I think a lot of the time, particularly in small businesses. Uh, the ability to invest on things that actually give you a pretty quick return mm -hmm. can often be beneficial in the beginning, right? Because it, it enables you to actually have more working capital that, that you can then reinvest. Um, and I think, I think very few people, when they're investing, they, they, they always look at, uh, they generally learn to look at uh, the sort of ROI, but they often kind of forget how long does it actually take to make that money back. Right. Sure. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's definitely a, a key place where I, I like to work with people as well, because I call that how a, I makes total sense. I call that a liquidity risk, right? Yeah. So even though you may get a, a few basis points, better return, if the investment is illiquid, uh, it may not be worth it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In my book, I, I listed, you know, 12 different types of, of risk and, and that's a big one. Right. Yeah. That's uh, you know, that's a difference between buying a six month certificate of deposit or buying a 10 year treasury. Yeah. Right? You're going to get a few, few basis points more, assuming you don't have negative interest rates. Uh, but do you want to tie your money up uh, and potentially pay a penalty, a penalty if you have to liquidate? Plus, you're also taking the market risk on top of yeah. that, because over 10 years, this is going to fluctuate. Now, it might work for you and it might work against you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very good, astute point. Excellent. Right. For a lot of people, when, when they're sort of in their early stages, right, again, mm -hmm. they're often in a situation where they, they tend to struggle a little bit with sort of the getting off the ground. They, like very typically, I, should, I think it's pretty common saying that I pretty much subscribe to, which is it generally takes a new business owner about three years getting to a stable position, right? What are some of the things that you see that, that can help cut down that time a little bit? Well, the old school, you know, I'm a, I'm a baby boomer, uh, make a plan, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be etched in granite, but outline a plan. I'm not talking about a formal business plan. Um, I can say I've had six, seven, eight. I don't even know. I've lost account of how many businesses I founded. Never sat down and wrote a formal business plan. The only time that's really necessary, in my opinion, is if you're going to get outside capital. Yeah. Uh, but at least have some sort of framework, uh, some sort of guardrail set up on how you're going to run this business. Yes, 36 months is a pretty good time period, but the truth is you're going to want to do it in half of that time, right? Uh, that's, that is a, that's a tough, tough thing to pull off. It is a very, I started my first business. I left a $60,000 a year job. The first year in business, I made $12,000, thousand bucks a month. Again, this is 30 years ago. It wasn't until the third year that I made as much money as I had um, given up. And then it, it went from there. So I considered that a, a success. Yep. But it takes a lot of, you know, frugality, penny pinching, whatever it is that you might want to call it. And, and you're trying to do that against a backdrop of what is a new business. Right, it doesn't necessarily. Even though you create this pl plan, you're going to have pivots, full-blown pivots or mini pivots. You're not really sure where this is going to go. It's a little like like writing a book or writing a screenplay. You know, you start out with a plan and you have your your best intentions, and then something changes. Yeah. Right. I mean. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean that. 
probably the first one to two years, what I see most people, what, what happens for most businesses, they start out with this plan and what tends to happen is they haven't really nailed in their, their niche. They haven't really nailed in their product. Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're too open armed, right? So they're looking at like, oh, I'll serve anyone anywhere type thing. And, you know, the faster they get to that niche, the faster they kind of really dig down and say, that's who we serve. The faster I generally see people ramp that up, right? And, and I think the, the biggest difference when you see people who are doing it the second time or third time, obviously they, are, they tend to have more money in the bank, which is yeah. always helpful. Uh, but the other thing that I see happening is that they tend to be much, much clearer on like their target audience and on specifically on, on um, you know, who they're serving. And, and I see that being probably one of the biggest differentiators. And, and that, that's what I look at from myself as well. Like with the, with the following businesses you do, that just that differentiator just becomes like so much more obvious, right? Because you've stumbled through it the first time. You're like, oh, it took us so much, so long time to figure out you know, who the real customer is. And then the second time around, it just, it, it tends to naturally come much, much faster. It's a little like when you get in your car and you're going someplace you've never been before. Yeah. The journey seems to take forever, right? But then you do it again and again. And before you know it, it's like it goes by in the blink of an eye because yeah. it's no longer unfamiliar. Um, I, have a, I have a lot of personal theories and anecdotes. One of my theories is that you are not a real business until you say no. Right. Yeah. Most businesses, they hang up a shingle. Well, I used to say when I first started my business, the answer to every question is yes. So we sold Macintosh computers back in the 90s, long before the Apple store and all that other stuff. And then one of our clients says, do you sell PCs? Yes, we'd never sold a PC in our life. Do you sell printers? Yes, we never sold a printer. Do you sell servers? And on and on and on and on. The answer to every question is yes. You are not a real business until the day comes when you can say no. If you are a service business, you are not a real business until somebody thinks enough of you to fire you, right? Again, these are my personal theories. It's okay, sort of like your 20s. You know, I got three boys, 19, 23, 28. And the 20s is for sowing your oats, experimenting, doing all sorts of stuff because the stakes are kind of low, right? Uh, when you're starting up a business and there's, and you're bootstrapping it and there's not a lot of expectations, it's okay to experiment a bit and make some mistakes. If that's yes. going to get you where you need to go, then I'm all for it. The only thing I will caution people is try not to make business killing mistakes, <laughs> you know, gargantuan mistakes. And a lot of that comes down to I mean, I did it myself. I did a deal, the biggest deal we ever did, $50,000. And uh, a week and a half later, the company uh, filed for bankruptcy. So I've written by that. I learned these mistakes the hard way. I thought I died and went to heaven that I did the biggest deal that we ever did. And less than two weeks later, I felt like someone had kicked me in the stomach. I ignored risk because I was so anxious to say, yes, 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 yes. Oh my God, look at the deal we did. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I love that lesson. I, I think, I think a lot of the time it's also. Uh, I mean, I, I see such a big distractor when 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 people do continue to say yes all the time, and they mm-hmm. suddenly get moved away from their core product, right? Because sure. very often to say yes to one client, you end up disrupting your whole business because you're trying so hard to. Uh, you're trying to, so hard to please that one client that, you know, others suffer or you don't have the capacity to bring more on and so on. And I, I think really, again, I mean, it's typical 80-20, right? But, but being able to look at, does this customer bring more value than the time and effort they take? And in the beginning, sometimes you want to take all these different clients, right? Because really what you're trying to do is you're trying to find a great market fit. And if you're touching a lot of people, you might either find a problem or you'll find something that could make them a uniquely good proposition, but it might not be something that your business is necessarily ready for at that point in time, right? So it definitely makes sense to do some testing and try out some stuff. But, but generally, again, my, my experience is definitely that when you, 
when you put yourself in a situation where you're, where you're willing to say no, that also means that you focus much more on your core clients, right? And it, it, it does enable bigger growth. Now, the problem is if you say no and you haven't found the right market fit, then you end up crippling yourself, right? So well, this, yeah. yeah, then you end up shooting with a laser instead of a shotgun. So yeah. I, I refer to those, those sort of early stage clients as micro clients. So I had, yeah. a, I had a, a client a few years ago who was complaining about um, the fact that he had all these micro clients. So I gave him homework. And as a coach, I give my, my clients homework. And I said, I want you to give me a list of all these micro clients. Well, they, these were people who started off from the get-go when the company, let's, let's, let's be blunt, they didn't have a pot to piss in. And yep. they were happy that anybody backed them. And I'm a big believer that you should be loyal to these people who took a chance on you when you were nobody. I'm not telling yep. you to turn your back on them. However, here we were a bunch of years later and the business had leveled up. And these micro clients were, again, were, were, you're, it's Pareto, it's 80, 20, 20 rule. These micro clients were burning up 80% of the resources, but they were only worth about 20% of the business. Not only that, by doing some simple math on this, I determined that they were leaving 10 grand a month in MRR on the table by not confronting these clients and say, look, I know you were loyal, but I need to gradually get you up to the current rate. Yep. There were some people who were paying almost nothing, peanuts for a service, the entry level price. And it's like, you're not that company anymore. Yep. That's a good thing, but you need to recognize it. And as much as I'm not necessarily a fan of saying that you need to fire your clients, although I have fired a client or two, um, in my day, but you do, you may have to have a little bit of a heart to heart with them and say, yeah. look, we, we got to work something out. I'll be willing to give you a loyalty discount, but within the next year to two years, you got to be up to market level or I can't do business with you anymore. You know, you'll find a, a more politic way to say that. Yeah. Um, but I see it happen all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's very common and, and, uh, the, the, the problem I see with a lot of these businesses that they, a lot of the time they don't realize that's what's happening, right? Which is actually mm -hmm, sure. worse. So one thing is if you know it's happening and you're aware, but if you don't realize that, that again, it actually, it just makes it even worse, right? Because you, you basically often end up putting yourself in a situation where, you know, the, the business is not growing because all your time and energy is going into clients that aren't actually bringing you enough value. And that, that it, it can really take, I mean, sometimes years out of business because they keep serving these old small clients. And they often it's again, because they don't know their finances, they don't know the numbers and so on. And therefore they don't actually know how big of a problem these people are, right? No, you need to know customer acquisition costs. Not only, you know, you know if we're going to level down from the balance sheet and income statement, we got to look at the lifetime value of a client, right? There's all sorts of different OKRs or KPIs or whatever acronym you want to use. Uh, you need to have some, some kind of number that you can track, right? Yep. And so that you can determine the patterns and figure that stuff out. And look, I don't want to sound too self-serving with this, but I'm going to do this anyway. Um, get some help, right? Um, I don't know that this client would have discovered this problem or, or let's just say, they probably would have discovered this micro client problem, but a hell of a lot later than when I brought it up because I come in as an outside observer, you know, living in a judgment free world. I'm not here to judge you that you're leaving 10 grand on the table. I'm here to raise your awareness that there is a cost and a risk here. Yep. You still have to decide what you're going to do about it from a tactical standpoint. That's a whole nother set of problems. But first, you got to recognize that you've got a problem. We need to flip the script and turn that problem into an opportunity. And then we have to figure out how do we build an SOP to deal with this now? And then how do we prevent this from happening again in the future? There are a whole series of iterative steps. Um, and that's tough to do alone. It is. And uh, 
I mean, this is one of the things with coaching that I, I mean, people say, wow, you know, you know it all. And I'm like, no, nope. but it's a million times <laughs> yes, easier to, it, course, it's a million times easier to come in and look at someone else's business than look at a business you're fully ingrained in. Oh right? yeah. Like, yeah. like, I oh, mean, yeah. the amount of times where I've been like giving someone advice and then I'm kind of sitting thinking, I'm like, I should do that too. <laughs> <laughs> Which, which for me, like th yes. the thing is when, when you're in the, in the mix of things, I mean, that's for me, that's always been the most valuable thing about coaching because when you're in the midst of things and, and like, you can't really, you can't move your head up and, and see your business like an outsider can. Right. And, and, and by the way, that's not just business. I mean, that doesn't, if you want to go to the gym or if you want to do different things, right. Like, you, you you can't look at yourself in the same way as an outsider. You you can't no. see the mistakes as easy, and and that that's what I always like the most about coaching, right? Because I I think I think the ability to to look at someone's business is I mean you definitely need to practice that and so on, but but I think it's it's not as necessarily as difficult as some people make it, um, but but there is a ton of work learning how to do it well and get the actual results right so when i look for a coach like i'm i'm, I'm not it's not so much for me that merits in terms of what they've done and so on but the two key things that i always care about is one are they walking the walk because you know i've had coaches that ran a business 20 years ago and you know if if they're not lo no longer in the game they don't necessarily see all the changes and so on and i've found that difficult so i, I always look for people who are in the game uh, the same if i'm looking for a trainer i want to find someone who's working out right now not someone that worked out 10 years ago right and and i think when you get to that point when you see someone who is struggling who is going through the same thing as you're uh, that their ability to just look at your business and see things so quickly is it's very interesting, right? It's yeah, it's fascinating, and, and, I, and I'll tell you, the um, most I would say the lion's share of the tactical things that I have done with my business over the last several years have have grown out of my working with clients, right? The yeah. online scheduling stuff that I use, how to build a funnel and social media, and all of that stuff. I've learned that from my clients. Right. Yeah. That's the tech. That is all um, stuff that I've learned from the DC, but that's the tactical part of things. And I don't want to be cavalier and say that that's the easy part, but it really is kind of the easy part. Um, what you're missing as an entrepreneur is the, the strategic part, the sort of high level stuff that you need to do that only comes from experience. Yep. Right? You're just not going to get it the first couple of years out going to take some time where me as a you know 30 year entrepreneur it's it's pretty rare and again i'm not saying this to be braggadocious but it's pretty rare that a client comes to me with something that i haven't seen or at least rubbed up against at one yeah. time or another that's that's pretty common but again that's just a that's just experience um, and the okay. only way to get experience is to experience it by making mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to make mistakes, but you don't want to make, you don't want to make the same mistake over and over. I often oh. say that uh, an experiment is only a failure if you didn't learn something from it, right? Yeah. Edison said, I found 2000 ways not to make a light bulb, right? He yeah. just didn't give up. He knew he was onto something and it was a lot of trial and error. That Definitely. you have to be careful with because you know, you can go broke. Very quickly. Excellent. Right, Henry. Just before we finish here, sure. what is the biggest management business mistake that you have ever made in your career? Management business mistake. I, I well, I don't know if this falls under the category. You, you, you tell me if, sure. if this if this fits what your your vision of. But when I started my first business, I had a partner and. Our philosophy was we agree to agree or we agree to disagree. So if we didn't have un unanimity on something, then it didn't happen. <clears throat> and when we started the business, we said, oh, we don't need a buy sell agreement. You know, that'll be fine. Well, you know what? It was fine until it wasn't fine. And so one of the things that I caution people to do, if you have business partners, is 
Get that nailed down before you've done a nickel's worth of business. Get the rules of engagement, call it a prenup, call it whatever. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. Make sure that you've got something memorialized before you become a success. Yes. I would say that's probably, and as a lesson I learned 30 years ago and I paid dearly for it when the time came to actually dissolve that, that partnership. So that's important. The second little one, hopefully that, that was in the right arena, but this is another, another one. This is, this is not come from, from my personal experience, but it's a cautionary tale that I give to, to all early stage entrepreneurs. Don't think that giving away equity in your company is a, is a free way to get a discount from people, from employees or key employees. Philosophically, you should exhaust the debt markets before you ever consider giving away equity in your company. Equity is your goal, your gold. Sorry, I said goal. Gold, G-O-L-D. It is your most important resource. People think, well, if I get a debt, Henry, then if my business goes south, I got to pay it back. Where if I give away equity, well, they have equity in a company that's dead. That's what we call, what I call false economy. If you have that mindset, I would encourage you to rethink that as, a, as an entrepreneur because you yeah. want to bet on success, right? Yeah. Giving away equity is not a, viable put option for your business. So did I get it Excellent. right? Did I answer the question? I, I, I love both of them. I mean, I've, uh, yes. I've, I've definitely had a couple of partnerships. I'm here to please. <laughs> I, I, I definitely had a couple of partnerships that didn't work out well. And uh, yeah, we've been there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I, I say nowadays that I, I take a business partnership more serious than I take marriage. And that's not because I don't take marriage serious, but it's because <laughs> That there's just, it's easier for someone to say, I'm walking away in a business partnership, right? Yeah. Like if you're in a marriage, you have kids and stuff, you know, both parties generally are somewhat interested in, in keeping things together. Sure. Whereas in a business partnership and particularly if life changes, right? Like one of the things that I always tell people when they're working with a partnership, you need to sit down. You need to look at the current goal. Because if one person's goal is to work on this for two years and then sell it, and the other person's goal is to work on this for 20 years, right. like, that can be okay. But you need to be aware of that. And, yes. and you will also need to, to make sure that you actually have things like saying, if you want to leave after two years, you know, what am I paying? How do we figure out what I'm paying? Yep. Like the amount of business I've seen that I've tried to evaluate their value. And like a lot of time, both people come out of it unhappy right? Which, which is never like, even if you're sitting back with a business, if you're unhappy about what happened, that's not something that helps you, right? So, so having that clear up front and also understanding it can change, right? Like, yeah, of course it can change. Yeah, a, yeah, a lot of the, just, just like yeah. your business plan. It's not, it's not chiseled in granite. Right? Exactly. You've got a document down and you can go back and you can revise it as circumstances change. But if you, ha if you start with nothing, then you just like the credit line. If you start with a zero dollar credit line, when something goes sideways and you need it, not the time to go shopping for it. Yeah. And, and I, I think fundamentally, like so often, you know, people aren't expecting changes. They're like, yeah, I mean, my business partner, you know, we're, we're both committed to this long term and uh -huh. so on. And yeah. then, you know, a year later, suddenly your business partner or yourself, uh, found a wife, you got a kid and, you know, suddenly you can't live for 1500 bucks a month anymore. You need to actually make money to take care of your family. And, you know, that changes the way that changes what you need from the business, et cetera. And, and if you haven't got a plan for that, you can burn yourself very hard. Yeah. yeah. When, when my business, I was married with a kid when I started my business, but my partner was single. So years later, when he got married, his wife said, you know, you need a key man life insurance and, a, and an agreement that says you as my new husband get hit by a bus. I don't want to be partners with your partner because that's what happens, right? She just, yeah. she's like, yeah, you need some kind of, we need some kind of deal put down on paper. 
So uh, we had to draw something up. It wasn't a, a, a buy sell. It was just uh, you get hit by a bus kind of a thing with an yeah. insurance policy. Um, look, it was better than nothing. Thankfully, neither of us got hit by a bus. So that's a good thing. Um, maybe it would have made the breakup easier. I don't know. <laughs> I, shouldn't, I, I shouldn't joke about such things. No. It's awful. Totally All understand. Right. Excellent, Henry. That was an awesome talk. And uh, thank yeah, thank you very much for joining me today. If people are desperate to get to know more about you or want to connect with you, what's the best ways of doing that? The simplest way is to go to www.henrydas.com. That's like my personal vanity site, but it has links to, you know, my, my business coaching and the, my finance course and my screenplays and, and uh, kind of all my silly stuff as, as we talked about. That's, that, that's really like the, the gateway into my world. Excellent. Thank you very much. And to the audience, we will get via the opportunity to listen us get, listen to us again next week. Thank you for listening to the Mad Singers Management Podcast. Please leave a review. It means the world to us. You can also learn more about management at madsingers.com.